Okay, hello everyone and welcome to the last technical session of today on mobile and wireless networks. Uh, we have four exciting papers today that we're going to over, uh, as always, leave your questions on the Slack channel and we will, after each talk, we will uh, cover as many questions as the time permits. My name is Yasaman Ghassanpour and I'm with Princeton University. With that, um, uh, I'll introduce the first paper titled MM Tag and Millimeter Wave Packet Scatter Network. Uh, it's going to be presented by, by Mohammed Hussein Mazahiri. Uh, Mohammed got his PhD in electrical engineering from Sharif University of Technology in Tehran in 2019. Since then, he's a postdoc fellow at University of Waterloo working on high data rate and low power IoT devices and integrated phase array transceivers at uh, millimeter wave bands. His passion in research is to develop innovative devices with ultimately low power consumption. So his research area spans IoT networks, MM wave devices, and innovative beamforming techniques. Uh, let's see the video now. Hi everyone, I am Mohamed Mazahari, and I'm going to present our paper, A Millimeter Wave Packet Scatter Network. This is a joint work with Alex Chain and Omid Abari. I am sure most of you have heard about millimeter wave technology, which is revolutionizing wireless networks by enabling much higher speed. In fact, 5G is based on this technology, which is going to be to enable many new applications such as smart cities, smart manufacturing, and virtual reality. However, the existing millimeter networks consume so much power. So in this talk, I'm going to explain how we can solve this problem. Unfortunately, there is high propagation attenuation at millimeter wave, which changes the way that the client communicates with the access points. So in order to establish the communication with the access point, the client should focus its energy toward the AP rather than spreading it in every direction. This requires to have directional transmission, which means that the client has to create a narrow beam and steer it toward the access point. To create and steer a beam, millimeter wave systems generally use a phase array. Phase array is a set of antennas that the signal of each element is controlled through an RF front end. The RF front end and the transceiver consume extensive amount of power at millimeter wave, so the phase array is not a suitable choice for devices with limited energy. To solve the power consumption of the millimeter wave network and enable devices with limited energy, we present MMTAC. MMTAC is a low-cost and low-power millimeter wave communication system that uses packet scatter technique. Yeah. MMTAC introduces a passive beamforming and it employs a self-interference cancellation technique. We have built a prototype and tested in a custom designed PCB and I will present the results of this test in the following slides. Now, Let's have a general look over the MM tag. The MM tag consists of an access point and a node. The access point sends a sine wave, which is at millimeter wave toward the node, and the node either absorbs this signal or reflects it back toward the access point. By receiving the reflected signals at the access point, it can detect the zero and one symbols sent by the node. As a result, the node picks back its data over the signal sent by the access point. Consequently, in this paper, we have two main challenges. The first challenge is that how can a backup security device perform beam alignments? Consider that we, we want to have a very low power consumption device. And the second challenge is that how can the access point detect the packet scatter signal from its own signal? So for now, let's focus on the first challenge, which is the beam alignment. To better understand the beam alignment challenge, I am here showing you an access point and a node that they should align their beams toward each other to establish the communication. 
Since the node is a mobile device and it might move to another location, again, it has to align its beam toward the access points. Remember, the typical way to create and steer the beam is to use a phase array. And since the phase array is power hungry, it's not suitable for our application. Now, the question is that, how we can steer the beam without using a phase array? Our solution is to use retroreflection technique. Before I explain the retroreflection concept, let me explain the principles of the beam forming. Here, I'm showing you a, a uniform linear antenna array that is receiving a signal X from direction theta to the normal of the array. If we want to, if we want to send the same signal toward the same angle, here is what we get. Now, just by comparing these two relations, you find out that by reversing the phase shift between the elements, the received signal is transmitted back toward the same direction. One possible approach to reverse the phase is to use a phase reversal circuitry, which reverses the phase of each element connected to it. As a result, it reflects the signal back toward the same direction. However, the existing phase reversal circuits have high power consumption and they are not suitable for our application. Our approach is to use Van Atta retro reflector. In Van Atta configuration, each antenna is connected to its mirror through passive equal phase transmission lines. In this manner, the order of the signals as you can see here are reverted and the passive phase reversal is implemented. As a result, the signal is reflected back toward the same direction. And this is exactly how we enable backscattered node to focus its reflected signal toward an access point without using a phase array. So far, we discussed about the first challenge, which was the beam alignment problem, and we explained our solution for that. Now, let's focus on the second challenge, which is the self-interference problem. As I mentioned in previous slides, the access point sends a sine wave at millimeter wave toward the node, and the node reflects this, sig this signal toward the receiver and the receiver receives this signal and tries to decode the node's data. However, there is a strong coupling between the transmitter toward the receiver that masks the signal coming from the node, so the receiver is not able to decode the node's data easily. Our solution is to converse the polarization. Before I explain the solution, let me briefly talk about the polarization itself. Each antenna transmits and receives indifferent polarization. In order for two antenna to hear each other, they should have the same polarization. Now, let me explain how we use this property to solve the self-interference. In the access point, I use a vertical polarization antenna that sends the millimeter wave signal toward the node in vertical polarization. At the node, I rotate the received signal by 90 degree and reflect the horizontal polarized wave toward the access point. As a result, at the access point, I will have two different signals in two orthogonal polarizations. One is vertical, which is a self-interference from the transmitter, and the other, the other one is horizontal, which is the node's signal. So, I use a horizontal polarization antenna at the receiver to only receive the signal from the node and get rid of the self-interference. Now, the question is how can the node rotate the polarization? To solve this problem, we design and develop an antenna that has two ports. As I am showing you here, it has port X and port Y. So when the signal goes through port X, the transmitting signal is going to be in X polarization. And when I put the signal on port Y, the signal goes in Y polarization. Now I'm using this antenna that we designed on our passive beamforming technique that I have already explained it to you. So basically, basically for each element of the antenna, it's using an antenna that has two ports. 
Now, the nice thing here is that the X port of wall antenna is connected to the Y port of its mirror. So as a result, the X and Y components of the signal are exchanged. Next, to complete the polarization conversion mechanism, we need a 180 degree phase shift, which is simply implemented using transmission lines. In this way, the polarization of the reflected signal is reverted for any incoming signal with any polarization angle, which enables the MM tag to support every possible orientations. And here's the implementation of the MM tag. On the left side, you can see the MM tag's node, and on the right side is the MM tag's deathbed that a signal generator and a spectrum analyzer were used as an access point. Now, let's explore the performance of the MM tag. Here, I start with the beamforming. The Y axis is, is the reflected power from the node received at the access point, and the X axis is the angle of the node with respect to the AP. For comparison, first let's look at the omnidirectional antenna. As you can see, it's great because it almost works for all angles, but the problem is that the amount of reflected power is weak, so it's not gonna work. Now, let's look at the results when we are using a fixed antenna array. Here's the result. As you can see, it's creating a nice beam, but the problem is that it only works when the tag is directly facing the access point. It's not covering all angles. And now, let's look at our results. As you can see, not only it enables high power, so we create a beam, but also our beam can work for different angles. So far, I've explained the micro benchmark evaluations. Now I'm going to explain the range and data rate of the MM tag in a real environment. For this experiment, I placed the node facing toward the access point and I recorded its reflected power at different distances from the access point. The X axis here is the distance between the access point to the node and the Y axis shows the node's reflected power at the access point in dBm. Here's the received power. As you can see, this power is high enough that the node is able to send its data with around 1 gigabit per second at 8 meters and with 150 megabit per second at 14 meters. So the MM tag can achieve gigabit per second data rates. Remember, the main promise of the MM tag was that it's enabling gigabit per second communication with consuming low amount of energy. And I've already shown you that it gives gigabit per second data rate, but let me show you what is energy consumption. Here I'm showing you energy consumption in nanojoule per bits. And for comparison, I'm also comparing it with Wi-Fi and pass millimeter wave work. All these technologies can enable almost the same data rate, except that MM tag has significantly low power consumption. So to conclude, I presented MM tag, which is a backscatter technology at millimeter waveband. MM tag benefits from high data rate of the millimeter wave technology, while it achieves very low power consumption of the backscatter technology. To develop MM tag, you face two important challenges. First, we solve the beam alignment by introducing a passive retroflexion solution. And second, we solve the self-interference by introducing polarization conversion. Finally, we practically investigated the performance of MM tag and showed it achieves gigabit per second data rate with very low power consumption. Thank you. Great, thanks for the wonderful talk. Uh, let's see if we have any questions. I think I'll start with my, uh, one question myself. So given that we have higher attenuation uh, at these frequencies and your tag is passive, could you comment on the uh, uh, kind of coverage range that you kind of see in your experiments and also 
accordingly, what's the use cases and applications that MM Tech can um, kind of enable? Sure, that's a great question. Uh, actually, um, in the paper, we have uh, presented the range performance of this MM Tech. And as you mentioned, uh, the range is not uh, as long as the other active transmitters as we expected. Uh, but the range is quite high. For example, at 14 meters, we could achieve um, about 150 megabit per second, uh, which is enough for many, many, many applications like video streaming, data transmission, high data rate um, applications, and it's mobile. So in terms of applications, uh, this, this test bed is not application oriented, but it can be applied for many new uh, requirements. Uh, one of the important um, uh, applications is to use for uh, cameras uh, where we want to stream data in a live manner and we know that the battery is limited so uh, it can easily transmit its data to toward the access point and uh, also there are some new emerging applications that require this amount of uh, high, high, da high data rate uh, uh, communication like uh, storage um, that you want to read data from in a storage device like hard drive or a database or something like that. And we want to read a huge amount of data without um, consuming so much power. Okay, great. So we have several questions in the Slack channel. Um, so how would MMTAG perform for high mobility users with high number of handovers? Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, for, for the MM tech to be able to communicate uh, as a, a network, uh, we need we have proposed two uh, different, uh, not different, two uh, uh, communication protocols. Since we are working at the limited wave, uh, we can uh, employ uh, the spatial multiplexing because we have narrow beams. We can um, assign beam to each node so we can read data and communicate with them separately. But there's a chance that two nodes become at the same angle, very close to each other, that the narrow beam cannot uh, separate between them. In that case, we can use time division multiplexing um, and uh, communicate with them in division time slot in, in uh, different time slots. I see. Uh, great. Uh, we have a question from Ishchain from UCSD. That's also my question. So uh, he's asking, first of all, an interesting idea, a great book, but he's asking about. Uh, if the orientation of the tag would affect the performance, especially because we're using polarization and orientation would change polarization. And do we assume it has to be aligned with the AP in terms of polarization match and any insights on how many MM tags are multiplexed together? That's a good, very good um, uh, question. And this was one of our challenges when we were uh, uh, thinking about this uh, idea. And we came up to the solution of uh, rotating any polarization. So it means that uh, when whatever the polarization of the access point is, the MM tag can rotate it to the orthogonal one. So it doesn't need to be aligned with the uh, access points polarization. So this was one of the big challenges for the mobile devices that we could solve it with that um, innovative polarization conversion technique that we provide in the paper. Uh, and in terms of number of nodes, we didn't explore this because it was um, uh, it was not uh, the focus of this paper. But it really depends on um, the data rate that we we want to achieve. So, and it depends on the uh, scattering of the devices around the access points. Great, thanks. We have more questions, but we have to go to the next paper. I encourage you to uh, continue the discussion in the Slack channel. Sure, thank okay. you. Okay, so with that, uh, we have to move to the uh, second paper uh, titled uh, BlueFi, Bluetooth over Wi-Fi. Uh, it's going to be presented by Sunway Chu. Hopefully I'm uh, pronouncing it correctly. Uh, uh, Sunway is currently a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan. He received uh, his BS degree in electrical engineering from uh, National Taiwan University in 2018. His research interests are in communication, mobile, and networking systems. We are ready to hear the presentation. Hello, everyone. I'm Xinwei Cho from the Real Time Computing Laboratory at the University of Michigan. Today, I will present a paper called BlueFi or Bluetooth over Wi Fi, co authored with my advisor, Kang Xing. 
Bluetooth is widely used to provide various functions. For example, Bluetooth transmitters can send location beacons, and many existing devices and software framework use Bluetooth beacons for wayfinding and navigation applications. In addition, Bluetooth is used as the protocol to wirelessly stream personal audio from a transmitter to Bluetooth headphones. However, what if there are no Bluetooth transmitters, but we still want to use Bluetooth devices? Previously, without a Bluetooth transmitter, we cannot use Bluetooth devices. However, even without Bluetooth transmitters, there might be some other wireless devices, such as Wi-Fi devices. For example, Wi-Fi access points might be installed in the environments. Some desktops or laptops may only have Wi-Fi chips. There are also USB Wi-Fi cards. Although Wi-Fi devices are previously deemed incompatible with Bluetooth devices, BlueFi enables Wi-Fi hardware to directly transmit Bluetooth signals. Specifically, with simple driver updates on Wi-Fi devices, BlueFi enables Wi-Fi hardware to directly transmit Bluetooth signals. By doing so, we can use Wi-Fi devices to transmit location beacons or stream Bluetooth audio. Since the transmitted signal look like a conventional Bluetooth signal, no modification to the Bluetooth devices is required. However, it is very challenging to realize this because Wi-Fi and Bluetooth signals are vastly different from each other. Here are the block diagrams of a Wi-Fi transmitter and a Bluetooth transmitter. They have completely different designs. There are some cross-technology communication work. However, most of them focus on Zigbee. Bluetooth does not have Zigbee's error correction and transmit bits four times faster, so it is more challenging. Compared to prior work, BlueFi is unique in that it works with unmodified Bluetooth devices using real widely adopted Wi-Fi chips. Also, we can implement not only Bluetooth broadcasting, but also general Bluetooth applications. Finally, we design and show that all the signal processing involved can be done in real time, thus satisfying real-time applications such as audio streaming. So how can we teach Wi-Fi hardware to speak Bluetooth? First, let's look at a Wi-Fi transmitter. The key observation here is, no matter what kind of the signal the Wi-Fi hardware is transmitting, if the analog waveform looks like a legitimate Bluetooth waveform, then commodity Bluetooth devices will have no trouble in decoding the signals. Now, with this observation, the problem becomes that given an arbitrary Bluetooth waveform, we want to find the corresponding Wi-Fi bits. The reason is, if such a reverse mapping exists, then whenever we want to transmit a Bluetooth signal, we can simply apply this mapping to find the corresponding Wi-Fi bits. We will send those Wi-Fi bits to Wi-Fi cards, and the Wi-Fi hardware will transmit the Bluetooth lookalike waveform, thus enabling the communication from Wi-Fi to Bluetooth devices. To find this reverse mapping, we can simply work our way backwards. However, during this process, a good conversion is harder to find for certain blocks than others. These are the challenges when we design BlueFi. We identify four major challenges. They are the insertion of cyclic prefix or CP, the quant modulation process, the insertion of pilots and nodes, and the four error correction coder or FEC coder. We will now discuss these challenges and how we overcome them. The first challenge is the CP insertion. Since Wi-Fi uses OFDM, a transmitter uses cyclic prefix to mitigate inter-symbol interference. Before the CP insertion block, Wi-Fi signals are divided into multiple OFDM symbols. The CP insertion block works as follows. For each symbol, the CP insertion block copies the tail and insert the CP before the beginning of each symbol. Additionally, real Wi-Fi chips employ symbol windowing by extending each symbol by one sample and then averaging the overlap samples. Knowing how to insert CP, we now want to find a reverse mapping. Specifically, given an arbitrary target output, we want to find the corresponding input. 
The requirement of this reverse mapping is that when the input is fed into a CT insertion block, the reconstruction should look most similar to the target output. We find such a reverse mapping that works well for Bluetooth systems. Specifically, suppose we have a target phase output like this, which represents Bluetooth bits 1010. Then for the corresponding input, we will keep the middle section. For the tail, we will copy part of the beginning and the tail of the target output. Additionally, the first sample of the input is copied from the next symbol. The input is constructed this way because when such input is sent into a CT insertion block, the reconstruction will look most similar to the target output. The next challenge is the quantum modulation process. In Wi-Fi systems, a symbol is generated in the frequency domain using the quantum modulator. Therefore, for a given symbol, we must find the corresponding quantum symbols. We work our way backwards. X of F represents the frequency domain samples we need to generate, and the X hat of F represents the selecting quantum symbol. We illustrate our solution as follows. In a complex plane, we have X of F, the target frequency domain samples. However, in Wi-Fi, the complex samples must be generated by the quantum modulator, which has these 64 possibilities. Therefore, for X hat of F, we simply choose the Wi-Fi quantum symbol closest to each X of F. The third challenge is the insertion of pilots and nodes. In the frequency domain, not all 64 subcarriers are data subcarriers that are modulating using 64 quantum. Some subcarriers are modulated by pilot signals, while some other subcarriers are no subcarriers. This causes the problem to the signal reconstruction because suppose that this is the spectrum we want to reconstruct. The insertion of pilots and nodes will corrupt the spectrum and affect the output waveforms. We overcome this challenge by using frequency planning. Here is an example. Suppose that we want to transmit Bluetooth signal at 2426 MHz. The frequency can be covered by either Wi-Fi channel 2, Wi-Fi channel 3, Wi-Fi channel 4, or Wi-Fi channel 5. Among all these candidate channels, the pilots and nodes of Wi-Fi channel 3 have the least overlap with the target spectrum. Therefore, we should use Wi-Fi channel 3. The final challenge is the FEC coder. Specifically, here we have a target output sequence that we want the FEC coder to generate and we want to find the corresponding input. The objective is, when that input is sent to the FEC coder, the reconstruction will have the least amount of bit flips when compared to the original target output. Since Wi-Fi uses convolutional codes, we can use the Viterbi algorithm, which guarantees optimality for general decoding problems. In our decoding problem, however, certain bit locations in the target output sequence are mapped to the subcarriers used for reconstructing Bluetooth signals. Therefore, certain bit locations are more important than others, and we want to avoid bit flips at those locations. Therefore, our first solution is to modify the Viterbi algorithm with weights. The more important the location, the higher the weights. By running the Viterbi algorithm, it naturally guarantees minimization of bit flips at those important locations. We also devise a second solution for the FEC coder, which is using lookup table with partial matching. Specifically, because of the well-designed Wi-Fi codebook, it is possible to find a direct one-to-one -one mapping from part of the output sequence to an input sequence. This lookup table guarantees no bit flips at the matching locations. Furthermore, lookup tables are computationally efficient, thus enabling a real-time operation of BlueFi. BlueFi also has some additional designs to support general Bluetooth operations, including scheduling signal transmission with high-resolution timers, so as to align with Bluetooth time slots. 
emulating frequency hopping by using different subcarriers within a single Wi-Fi channel and using multi-slot transmission to boost throughput. Now, I would like to present some evaluation results of Blue. Here we use two widely adopted commercial Wi-Fi chips as transmitters and three different smartphones as Bluetooth receivers. Under all different conditions, all smartphones are shown to reliably receive Bluetooth signals. Even with different Wi-Fi transmit power, the smartphones can receive Bluetooth signal correctly. We evaluate running BlueFi and normal Wi-Fi operation simultaneously. BlueFi only decreases normal Wi-Fi throughput very slightly. In addition, even when we saturate the Wi-Fi channel, the smartphones can still reliably receive Bluetooth signals. We also showed that BlueFi can support streaming Bluetooth audio. Specifically, we verified that it can stream audio from a commercial Wi-Fi chip to commodity unmodified Bluetooth headphones. Additionally, we use an industry standard tool to measure the performance. The packet error rate was 23%, and a good put of 93.4 kilobit per second was achieved. In conclusion, BlueFi enables direct communication from Wi-Fi to Bluetooth devices. Its design involves reversing the operation of Wi-Fi transmitter. We have shown that BlueFi works on real Wi-Fi chips and with different unmodified Bluetooth devices. We have constructed different Bluetooth applications, including Bluetooth location beacons and audio. Finally, all signal processing can be done in real time. This concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. We already have one question uh, in the Slack channel. Uh, nice idea. Okay, I think I don't see it anymore. Okay, now, yeah, so nice uh, job. The question is about uh, Bluetooth audio communication requires uh, rigid synchronization, as you know. Um, so the questioner uh, is wondering how the synchronization between Wi Fi and Bluetooth can be achieved, especially when Wi Fi is using CSMA CA. Uh, that's a great question. And um, so I discussed like a, 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 a couple of different ways in the paper, but mainly we are using a high resolution timer. And also a detail I'm, I'm now written into the paper is that I'm actually sending the US packet directly. So I'm bypassing the dri driver layer itself. So by sending the US packet directly, I can minimize the time uh, uncertainty between the sending of Wi-Fi packet to the actual transmission of Wi-Fi. And in addition, uh, CSMA CA in Wi-Fi, uh, that uncertainty is relatively short compared to Bluetooth's uh, like time slot uncertainty. And Bluetooth receiver itself does expect that the transmission is aligned with the start of each time slot. But when the Bluetooth receiver does not receive any no or packets from the master, Bluetooth receiver actually have a wider window to try to resynchronize with the master, or in our cases, will be the Wi-Fi uh, wi devices. Okay, thank you. So next question is from Siva. Um, he's saying, if I'm not mistaken, the idea enables communication from Wi-Fi devices to Bluetooth headphones, but uh, how do you plan to do the other way around? Yeah, so the other way around is actually, a, a, in my opinion, a little, a, probably a bit more challenging problem. And that is because there are some hard theoretical limits because Bluetooth has lower uh, uh, bandwidth than Wi-Fi. So theoretically, if Wi-Fi is back a larger bandwidth, then, then in theory, we cannot implement the other way. But there are uh, there does have like a couple of like prior works that discuss this possibility. So, um, so I think like one way we can look at it is look at the application examples because uh, the first reason is that the Bluetooth application is mainly uh, uh, the Bluetooth, um, for example, beacons and 
audio accounts for a large selection of applications and in these two applications we don't need to implement the, the traffic in the opposite direction and the second reason is that uh, some prior words also discuss like in this uh, direction and some prior words discuss that using like spectrum and anal an analyzer functionality in Wi-Fi chips that potentially could implement this direction and, and finally, uh, there does have some like a uh, modulation, um, modulation property we might be able to use uh, because like some of the modulation in Wi-Fi is actually quite similar to Bluetooth. So it might be possible in the future we will explore, explore this direction. But again, in this work, because of the application needs, so we mainly implement the, uh, so to speak, downlink direction. Yeah. I see. And one final, very short question. So is BlueFi compatible with all Wi-Fi standards? Yeah, so this work, uh, we are utilizing the overall architecture of Wi-Fi standard and not bind to any specific hardware, uh, hardware functionality. So because we are utilizing the overall uh, modulation process that every Wi-Fi device should conform to, so that implies that this methodology is uh, applicable to all different Wi-Fi uh, devices. Okay, thank you. We have more questions in the Slack channel. Thank well, you, everyone. Yeah. I will reply. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, so with that, we move on to our third paper titled uh, Two Beams Are Better Than One, Two Watts Reliable and High Throughput Millimeter Wavelengths. It's going to be presented by Ish Jain from the UCSD. Uh, he's a third year PhD candidate and holds a master's degree from NYU and bachelor's from IIT Kanpur, India. He's affiliated with the Wireless Communication and Sensing Lab at UCSD, advised by uh, Dinesh Bratia. Uh, Ish is passionate about new technology in 5G wireless communication, autonomous vehicles, and virtual reality. Recently, he has built a 28 gigahertz MMW tested using phased arrays and demonstrated a robust and high speed wireless link in practical scenarios. His research is published in top networking conferences such as SIPCOM, MSTI, and Mobile. Now, let's hear the presentation. Traditional millimeter waves are thought to be single directional beam. And here, in contrast, I show that two beams are better than one. I'm East Jan from UC San Diego. And first, I'm going to show you my vision of the future. My car is driving me back home from my lab, loaded with sensors such as LIDARs, cameras, radars. The car share the sensor data with the infrastructure base station and other vehicles so they can extend their road vision and avoid accidents. I arrived at my home safely and put my virtual reality headset. The wireless access point is providing high quality video content to my headset over the wireless link. So what do we require to truly enable these applications? They require a high throughput wireless link, which must be reliable and easy to maintain with low overhead. We consider millimeter wave band because they provide high throughput because of abundant bandwidth compared to sub six gigahertz. But are they reliable? They use directional beams to combat high path loss at these frequencies, but they make the system vulnerable to many factors. For instance, user mobility causes beam to get misaligned with the base station and blockage brings the link down to an outage which makes it unreliable. We present MM Reliable, a reliable millimeter wave system that uses smart analog beamforming and user tracking to maintain a reliable link. While traditional millimeter wave uses single directional beam towards the user, in multi-beam, we split the beam in two directions, one along the direct path and one along the reflected path. Why two beams are better than one? It is because when a blocker crosses a single beam, it completely occludes the link and bring outage. While in multi-beam, 
when one beam is blocked, the other one is still active. It is very unlikely that the blocker blocks all the beams at the same time. And in this way, multi-beam avoids a single point of failure and therefore they are reliable. At a high level, we achieve high reliability as a corollary of using multi-beam. Next, we develop a constructive multi-beam that allows us to achieve high throughput. And sometimes it is even better than what we get with single beam. We establish these constructive multi-beam on a standard millimeter wave based arrays and make it protocol compliant with 5GNR. Finally, we establish a mechanism that allows us to be proactive instead of being reactive in maintaining these links under user mobility. So we have already shown how multi-beam improves reliability. Now let me show you how it also improves throughput. Take a simple example where we have a total transmit power of A square. And so for single beam, we transmit the signal A and assume the channel has path loss of unity. So the received signal would be A and it leads to the SNR or the signal to noise ratio proportional to A square. Now imagine something similar for multi-beam. And here we use the same transit power A square and we transmit signal A by root two in each direction so that the total power you see A square by two plus A square by two is the same A square. The signal goes through the channel, assume both channel has path loss of unity. So the received signal would be the sum of the two A by root two plus A by root two is root two A. And the SNR would be a square of the magnitude would be proportional to two A square. We see that the SNR is two times higher than single beam. And this higher SNR leads to higher throughput. It seems like a counterintuitive to observation, but it comes from a very fundamental concept called maximum ratio combining, which is already known in literature. But prior work on millimeter wave, which uses a single beam, they don't utilize this game. For the first time, we show that we can practically utilize them. Okay, so it seems like a simple example with the ideal channel. Let's see what happens when we have a more realistic channel. In practice, the reflected path travels extra distance and it accumulates an extra phase of J sigma. If this phase is say 180 degree, the signal that travels along the reflected path will arrive in opposite phase. And when it adds up with the direct path signal, they will cancel each other and cause destructive interference. But if we ensure that the two signals are adding up in phase, then we will get higher signal strength because we have constructive addition. And so we call it a constructive multi-beam. So how do we establish constructive multi-beam? What we do, we take the reflected signal and multiply it by opposite phase minus sigma which will cancel out the reflected path phase and we get the same received signal root to A and the same SNR to A square as you get with an ideal channel. So the first element which we require to achieve constructive multi-beam is phase control. Okay, so is the phase control the only thing? It turns out, no. Here we still assume the reflector is as strong as the direct path. What happens when we have weak reflectors? So let's model this and assume the reflected path has an extra path loss of delta. And usually delta is less than one. So when the reflector is lossy, so we transmit the same power in each beam? Actually, no. We show that in our paper that the optimal configuration is when we transmit power along the reflected path that is proportional to its path loss delta, which means if the reflector is weak, we transmit less power. And if it is, it is strong, we transmit higher power. And this configuration, we show that we get maximum SNR that is proportional to one plus delta square times A square. Now you can plug delta equal to one, which gives one plus one to A square that we have already seen with the ideal channel. So the main point is the following. Besides phase, we also need power control to make sure we always achieve optimal performance. 
So in summary, constructive multi-beam requires both phase and power control. And with them, we can make sure the SNR is always better than single beam phase. Now, one may ask, do strong multipath really exist for millimeter wave? Yes. In addition to direct path, there are reflected paths where signal reflect on surfaces like glass. Here, we list a set of typical reflectors in various indoor and outdoor environment. And we see that the reflectors are strong as they provide only one to 10 dB attenuation compared to direct path. And so strong reflectors provide higher SNR and higher throughput using our constructive multi-beam. So multi-beam looks great, but can we achieve it using standard commercially deployed millimeter wave hardware or do they require some special hardware? We use a single RF chain connected to an analog phase array at the access point. The phased array consists of variable phase shifters and attenuators that are required to create any directional beam. And we utilize the same standard phase array to create our constructive multi-beam with appropriate phase and power control. And so constructive multi-beam doesn't require any specialized hardware as it can be generated with commercial off-the-shelf phase arrays. Okay, so does it require any specialized protocol to create multi-beam? Let's see, to create constructive multi-beam, the access point needs to know the angles phi one and phi two, and the relative path loss delta and phase sigma. MM Reliable estimates these parameters using intrinsic features of 5G and R protocol. We use the mandatory beam training phase, which scans multiple angles across space. And using these training signal, we estimate the angles phi one and phi two. We then use only two additional probes using 5G and R reference signals to estimate delta and sigma. We show in our paper how we estimate these four parameters using standard signals in 5G NR. The final piece of puzzle is to proactively maintain a multi-beam for a mobile user. The issue is the channel parameters would become outdated over time. So we need to estimate them again and again. One way is to repeat the beam training phase to re-estimate these parameters, but it incurs high overhead because of long duration and high frequency of beam training phase. And also their reactive approach because they react when the link would have already suffered an outage. We follow an alternate approach where we replace the beam training phase with multiple reference signals. These signals create low overhead because they spread over time and frequency grid that does not affect the communication. And thus using these low overhead signal, we can track a mobile user over time, even well before the link would suffer an outage due to user mobility. And we periodically update the multi-beam parameters and thus refine multi-beam over time. The detail of these process are there in our paper, but in this way, MM Reliable proactively maintains a reliable and high throughput link. We evaluate MM Reliable on a 5G testbed that we developed at 28 gigahertz called M-Mobile. And here we show our phase arrays, which has 64 antennas, the basement FPGA from Xilinx and IF mixer from Corvo that we used at our base station. And we also show the USRP X310, which we used at our mobile node. We evaluate MM Reliable in various indoor and outdoor settings with up to 80 meter link. And we leverage our FCC 28 gigahertz license to do experiments in our campus area. We establish our multi-beam and ask a volunteer to walk across the link and block it. Here we show the received SNR over time and compare multi-beam in blue against single beam in red. We see that when direct path is blocked, the single beam SNR goes below an outage threshold, while multi-beam SNR remains way above it. Even the reflected path blockage caused negligible SNR drop for multi-beam. Hence, multi-beam maintained high throughput despite occasional blockages. We also did end-to-end -end experiment with blockage and user mobility and show that MM reliable is better than two baseline. One reactive baseline, which is based on single beam, so it cannot avoid link outage. And the other is wide beam, which does not take 
proper advantage of directional communication. MM Reliable achieves 100% median reliability while providing 1.5 times higher throughput than single beam baseline. Please refer to our paper for more results and benchmarks on MM Reliable. So to summarize, we show that the traditional single beam system are not optimal for millimeter wave. And our proposed multi-beam system provides better reliability and higher throughput. MM Reliable is open source and the artifacts are available in the link below. I'm very thankful to my collaborators at WCSNG lab at UC San Diego. Thank you for listening and feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you, Ish, for the great talk. Uh, let me see if there are any questions. I start with uh, one question of my own. So how sensitive uh, your protocol algorithm are on the accuracy of this reflected path estimation because you're using course estimation, basically building on top of leveraging the existing sector sweep uh, signals. So uh, what's the accuracy that you achieve and how um, sensitive your algorithm is on, on that accuracy? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, we did some simulation to verify the accuracy of the phase sigma and the path loss delta. And the results are, it is not very sensitive. We show that the phase, if it is uh, different from the optimal point by up to 150 degrees, and we still achieve better than single beam. And for path loss, it is even larger, like up to 20 dB range that we verify and the results are in our paper. We achieve better than single beam, even if uh, the sigma and delta are not very accurate. But we show that uh, if our algorithm provides accurate phase and uh, delta, and uh, we achieve better. Okay, thanks. Uh, we have a question in the channel. A very cool idea and amazing work. A specific direction uh, beamforming has the advantage of high signal quality. So if you're using line of sight, your signal quality. Sorry, that was one of the new um, aspects of MMV. What is the drawback of having multiple beams? how to handle interference, how much overhead do to signal recovery across multiple beams? There are multiple questions here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I understand. So um, single beams, people use it because they think that it is easy to create. But here for the first time, we show that they are not optimal and multi-beams are optimal. So we should go for multi-beam. And now in our paper, we show that they are practical. Basically, we can create them with low overhead using the standard architecture and protocols. So now we basically start a new direction. And uh, the challenges, for example, uh, extending it to multiple users at the question ask is our future work. Right, thank you. Um, another question. So um, I can imagine that in blockage, this would uh, really help uh, in terms of maintaining the link in terms of uh, environmental mobility. But what if the user itself moves? Then I would assume both the reflected pass and line of sight pass will be uh, outdated. So how would you think this can be scaled to um, uh, kind of uh, including mobility resilience in the, in the picture? Uh, yeah, so we develop uh, user tracking algorithm. So when the user moves, uh, the angles are misaligned and our algorithm can accurately track the angle, basically estimate the angle over time without requiring uh, the beam training, uh, the exclusive scanning. So the idea, uh, as we explained in the paper, is that it leverages fine-grained measurement of how the signal power for each beam varies over time. And we show that it is very highly correlated to the shape of beam pattern, which is usually already known. And we use this insight to track the user, and it achieves very high accuracy of like up to one degree of error, as we have uh, mentioned in the paper. Okay, so you are suggesting like proactive adaptation to mobility as a result of sensing the angle of the departure. Okay, great. Uh, yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, with that, we move uh, to the last uh, presentation of this session. Uh, it's titled Concurrent Interference Cancellation, Decoding Multi-Path Collisions in LoRa. The presenter is Muhammad Osama, uh, Muhammad uh, is a second year PhD student at the University of Wisconsin Madison. His area of interest is in wireless systems and networks. Uh, and with that, we are ready to hear the presentation.
Hello everyone. My name is Muhammad Osama Shahid. I am a graduate student at University of Wisconsin Madison. I will be presenting concurrent interference cancellation decoding multipacket collisions in LoRa. It is a joint work with Milan Filippos, Krishna Chintalapodi, Professor Suman Banerjee and my advisor Bhuvan Krishna Swami. Recently a number of applications have called for long range and low power communication. For example, smart agriculture requires wireless connectivity of soil health sensors spread over several square kilometers. Similarly, smart homes and smart cities require connectivity of IoT devices over large distances. To address the needs of these applications, a number of technologies have emerged, such as Sigfox, LoRa, and NB-IoT. Amongst these, LoRa is the dominant one, a widely used technology due to its operation in unlicensed spectrum and distribution operation, to name a few. LoRa is long-range communication protocol that attains distances of tens of kilometers and is low power. It supports data rates of up to few kilobits per second. LoRa's modulation and demodulation is different from conventional schemes. Consider frequency shifting where data is transmitted by shifting the frequency of the carrier signal between F1 and F2. LoRa, on the other hand, uses chirp spread spectrum, CSS in short, as its physical layer modulation, which gives it capability to achieve such long range and low power. In CSS, the frequency of the signal varies linearly along with time. CSS uses entire bandwidth and thus renders it robust to narrowband interference. CSS encodes data by cyclically shifting the base up chirp as shown in the figure. The starting frequency of the chirp encodes the data. For example, the two different data values of symbol one and symbol two are encoded in two distinct starting frequencies fi and fj. Each of these symbols are obtained by shifting the up chirp. It must be noted that time shift and frequency shift are equivalent in a chirp signal. LoRa transmitters decide the bandwidth of operation and spreading factor during system setup. Spreading factor or SF is the number of bits encoded per symbol. That means two to the power SF is the number of unique starting frequencies between zero to the bandwidth. Now let's have a look at LoRa's demodulation. A LoRa packet consists of eight up chirps in the preamble. A standard LoRa demodulator locates the preamble using correlation and then aligns itself to the first data chirp. It then dechirps the symbol by multiplication with a down chirp. This results in a signal having a constant frequency equal to the starting frequency of the chirp. Taking an FFT of the signal concentrates the energy into a single peak. The frequency index of the maximum peak thus gives the data value. LoRa's simple modulation demodulation are easy to implement and is therefore widely used. It is also immune to timing offsets since any time offset will be translated into frequency offset. LoRa uses Aloha-based MAC protocol where transmitters operate in a distributed fashion. This poses an issue in applications requiring high density of wide area deployments such as hundreds of devices in a farmland. As the network scale increases, the probability of packet collisions increases. When the LoRa demodulator takes the FFT of the dechirp signal, multiple peaks appear due to the interfering packets. It then does not know which peak to choose and therefore fails at demodulating the symbols accurately. Recently, there has been a lot of interest in decoding LoRa packet collisions and demodulate each packet from the interfered signal. Poir is one of the pioneering works in this area. Poir leverages hardware imperfections to disentangle each packet. F-Track is another work that uses short time Fourier transform to look for frequency track continuity to identify accurate frequencies. N-Scale, on the other hand, tries to translate timing offsets to FFT peak heights through non-stationary signal scaling. As we have seen that LoRa chirps have time and frequency variation, majority of the existing works operate either on time domain or frequency domain to get the best of one of them. We present concurrent interference cancellation, CIC, a novel demodulator that uses both time and frequency components of the collided signal to decode individual packets. Let's look at three packet collision scenario as in the figure. Consider this window of demodulation. We expect C1 to be the peak frequency in the FFT but interfering pack peaks of packet number two, C21 and C22 also show up in the FFT. And similarly for packet number three, C31 and C32 also show up in the FFT. When standard LoRa demodulator demodulates this window, it will choose C22, the blue peak, because it is the highest peak. Whereas C1, the red peak is the true symbol that should have been demodulated. As we can see, simple peak detection algorithm of standard LoRa does not help here. We make an observation that the symbol C1 is the only one that is present throughout the time window, whereas the interfering symbols transition to their next respective symbols. 
CIC therefore observes all the frequencies and chooses the only one that is present for the whole length of the current window. Let's look at a sub window that covers this left half of the signal. In the FFT of this sub window, C22 and C32 are not present. Similarly, for the sub window that covers this right half of the signal, C21 and C31 are missing. I want to point out that only C1 appears in all these windows. This is the key insight on which CIC builds upon. The first question, therefore, we ask in the design of CIC is how to choose these sub windows. A trivial approach could be to select equal sized sub windows. If we want to cancel all the interferers and get good time resolution, we must choose small windows. However, frequency is inversely proportional to time and therefore small FFT windows would lead to poor frequency resolution. That is the peaks in the FFT are not sharp enough and, there, and therefore cannot be canceled. If we were to choose large windows to get sharp FFT peaks as in the lower figure, we will not get good time resolution of when each interfering symbols is appearing in the FFT. This time frequency trade-off is explained by Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So the question still remains, how should one select sub windows to achieve the best of both time and frequency resolutions? We propose to address this by determining the knowledge of symbol boundaries of colliding packets. We have built a framework where we detect the start of the colliding packets in a given session using preamble correlation, similar to standard LoRa. Since LoRa symbol durations are fixed, we determine the symbol boundaries of each packet in this session from the packet start time. Then we iteratively demodulate each packet. Consider we are demodulating packet number one in this case. We determine the boundaries of packet number two and three to be as shown by the bidirectional arrows in the figure. In order to cancel the interfering symbols of packet number two, we need the best frequency resolution for packet number two. First, we choose two sub windows that cover most of the packet number two. Similarly, for packet number three, we choose a window to be precisely up to the boundary of packet number two, such that it has best frequency resolution for both symbols in packet number three. In the next step, CIC takes spectral intersection of FFTs for each interfering packet. FFT intersection corresponding to packet number two sub windows removes all the peaks of packet number two. And similarly, FFT intersection corresponding to packet number three sub windows removes all the peaks of packet number three. Finally, the intersection with the main FFT recovers C1 peak with the best frequency resolution because only C1 was present in all the windows. In our paper, we derive the limits of time frequency resolution that is achievable using CIC. This poses the fundamental limitation of the interference cancellation of CIC. We have also identified and addressed some corner cases such as two consecutive symbols falling into the same bin or two interfering symbols falling into the same bin, to name a few. One such scenario is the impact of near-far effect, where transmitters closer to the receiver with high SNR dominates those with low SNR. To address such problems, we propose to use features such as power and CFO to filter out interfering symbols. While locating packets, CIC determines power of each packet and then uses a power threshold to remove peaks that are not within the power range of the packet of interest. We have also implemented some prior work as part of CIC feature filtering, where we filter out interfering peaks based on their carrier frequency offsets. Putting all these components together, we have built a CIC pipeline. CIC starts by locating packets in a received buffer and then detects symbol boundary for each one of them. Then it iteratively decodes each packet. While decoding each, we keep symbol boundaries of other packets and then select the sub windows that promise best available time and frequency resolution. And the CIC spectral intersection filters out interfering peaks. To address issues like near far effects, CIC uses additional features like power and CFO filtering. At the end, CIC spectral edge difference outputs one single symbol in case if there are still multiple candidates left. Due to time constraint, we will not be covering spectral edge difference in this presentation, but kindly refer to our paper for details on that. As opposed to standard LoRa, we have separate blocks for demodulation and decoding. CIC demodulator outputs demodulated symbols for all interfering packets that are decoded parallelly using separate blocks of standard LoRa decoder. We have CIC implementation in MATLAB, Python, and GNU Radio, which can be found on the GitHub link at the bottom. We evaluated CIC in four different deployment scenarios. In each scenario, a total of 20 LoRa nodes transmitted packets at a predetermined transmit rate. We used Adafruit LoRa boards as transmitter and USRP B200 as a base station. 
the scenarios D1 and D4 test CIC in very high and very low SNRs respectively, as evident from the SNR values. Due to time constraint, I will be presenting results only for these two scenarios of D1 and D4. Please find more details in the paper. We compare CIC against standard LoRa, FTRAC, and POIR. Here we plot the overall network throughput as a function of increasing aggregate rate. That means each node randomly transmits packets such that the average aggregate number of packets per second increases as seen in the x-axis. As the aggregate rate increases, the probability of two or more packets colliding increases. In scenario D1 with high SNR, at high aggregate rate, CIC outperforms F-Track by four times and Quire and standard LoRa by over 45 times. This improvement is due to the best resolution in time and frequency that is achieved by CIC. At higher rates and higher probability of collisions, best resolution in time as well as in frequency is the key to decoding packets. This is evident at low aggregate rates where the improvement is smaller. This is due to lower probability of collisions. Therefore, CIC is capable of decoding packets even at higher aggregate rates, thus improving overall network throughput. At low SNR scenario, D4, a similar trend can be observed. Although the absolute throughput of CIC is lower in D4 compared to D1 due to low SNR, the relative improvement in throughput over existing techniques is still high. In scenarios such as D4, where the nodes have varying SNRs, additional features such as power filtering and CFO filtering improves the decodability of collided packets over F-Track and standard LoRa. Please refer to our paper for more results and details on the impact of each feature on the overall performance of CIC. I want to thank you all for your time and I'm happy to answer further questions. Thank you, Mohamed. That was a great talk. Uh, so I'll start with a question. Uh, maybe you said that I missed it. So it seems that um, the accuracy significantly depends on the preamble detection, right? So how would sure. uh, you take care of that? What was the accuracy that you achieved and what are the sources of error that might happen? Yeah, so that's a, uh, thanks for the question. That's a great question. And that is true that CIC uh, depends upon the accurate detection of preamble. And uh, so the, um, the thing is that we are using preamble correlation as opposed to other works uh, like standard LoRa uh, uses just the dechopping operation and, uh, and looks for the eight consecutive uh, uh, peaks. Whereas a CIC performs correlation and correlation gives better accuracy in, detection, uh, in the detection of preamble. Yes, there are some sources of error. For example, um, CIC's packet detection accuracy degrades if we move uh, in the in if we move uh, in the SNR domains that are less than minus ten dB. In that scenario, CIC's packet detection uh, degrades, uh, and standard LoRa is still able to detect packets in th in those scenario. But standard LoRa is not able to resolve collisions in those scenario. So there is some sort of trade off that we are talking about over here. So um, yeah, the preamble detection accuracy is uh, is the strong point on which you know CIC builds upon. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, we have a question in the channel. Does the use of other spectrum analysis algorithms other than FFT change the result? Um, uh, sorry, I, I didn't uh, get that. Uh, so. The question is asking if we use other spectrum analysis algorithm, not using FFT basically. Uh, would that change your algorithm or is that so basically uh, so the thing is that um, CIC uses a chirp spread spectrum and chirp spread in chirp spread spectrum the uh, frequency of the signal varies linearly with time so it's a chirp signal and there is this process of de-chirping that is involved and after which we have to take the FFT so FF taking the FFT in the final signal is the core of uh, LoRa signals we can't get away with that but yes there are different techniques that are already there for example Quire uh, and F-Track um, so, so Quire is something that we are already using uh, in our work as part of a module that increases that uh, that improves the prof performance of CIC uh, and there is, there is, there are some other works as well. Uh, we, I mean, there is still the, uh, there is still improvement that can be done, and we are still looking forward to uh, address those improvements in our as part of our future works as well. Right. Uh, one final question. Uh, two actually okay. similar question. I combined one. Uh, great work. Uh, so the question is about Thanks. what happens if uh, different uh, power or SNR distributions. Uh, we have among the devices that are sending the packets. 
Uh, that's a great question. So um, we are using power filtering as part of our CIC module, right? Now the thing is, if we have diversity across uh, diversity of powers across different packets, that is a good thing for CIC because CIC will then choose thresholds that will be able to cancel out the other interfering peaks in a better way. Uh, the problem would be in those scenarios where all the packets have similar power. In those scenarios, the all the packets will, will fall into the same threshold uh, where CIC may have hard time decoding the packets. But uh, as we have seen, that is not the case for real scenarios. In real scenarios, the distance from nodes to the base station is uh, different for all the nodes. And in such scenarios, the power variation actually helps CIC. So that is a plus point for CIC. Hope that answers the question. Great word, thank you. Uh, thank you so this uh, brings up to the end of this session. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I want to point out that we have two sponsor events next. First, uh, a workshop by Facebook and a panel by Microsoft. So it's gonna be a short break, one minute, and then we will have those two exciting events. With that, I wanna conclude this session. Thanks everyone for uh, attending this session.